the archetype of initiation, sacred space, ritual process, and personal transformation. Lectures and Essays by Robert Al Moore. Sacred Space. Let me start with a few words about my interest in the topic of sacred space and ritual process. In addition to teaching psychology and religion at the Chicago Theological Seminary, I am a diplomate analyst of the Alfred Adler Institute, and I am currently an analyst in training at the C.G. Jung Institute. I have private analytic practices in Hyde Park and Evanston. As chair of the Religion and Social Sciences section of the American Academy of Religion, I explore the relationship between psychology and the phenomenology of religion. I have done a good deal of field research in the area of minority religions and occultism and co-authored with Gordon Melton a book entitled The Cult Experience, Responding to the New Religious Pluralism. I have also been studying contemporary understandings of ritual. The September 1983 issue of Zygon, Journal of Religion and Science, included the proceedings of a symposium I organized for the Institute for Religion in an Age of Science on Victor Turner's work on ritual and human adaptation. His article in that issue relates brain, body, and ritual and presents the relationship of archetypal theory to culture, the brain, and neurophysiology. Last year during my sabbatical, I studied the implications of Turner's work for the field of psychology and religion and for spiritual leadership. I have also been studying the relationship of sacred space to this field and some of the material here was included in a book I am currently co-editing, Anthropology and the Study of Religion. Presently, there is a revolution in the understanding of sacred space. To start with a referent for each reader's own experience, Diagram 1 depicts the normal developmental periods and major life transitions described in Daniel Levinson's book, The Seasons of a Man's Life. The quest for regenerative liminal space usually occurs during some form of life transition, whether elicited by one of Levinson's major life cycle changes or some unexpected trauma. Everyone has some personal knowledge of this quest, so I urge readers to reflect on their own experiences of sacred space as they read this material. When people act crazy by conventional standards, they are often searching for some kind of extraordinary space that will allow them to leave an old phase of life behind and experience initiation into an entirely new phase. Age-old human existential issues bring with them a yearning to locate and enter a sacred temple where the issues can be addressed, where the constructive reorientation can safely occur, and where the behavior of self and others can once again begin to reintegrate and make sense. The three pages of Diagram 2 show the three-phase structure of initiation as a transitional process in relation to sacred space. Ten horizontal listings run across all three pages to provide a map of the theories and issues which we will discuss. The diagram itself moves across the three pages from left to right, with each page describing one of the three phases of initiation from the point of view of all ten of the theories or issues. In phase one, ordinary, everyday consciousness is challenged as the individual's life world grows less viable and morbid. In the sacred space of phase two, however, the ordinary consciousness is transcended as the individual's everyday life world is dismantled and deconstructed. Phase 3 then completes the process of initiation as the ordinary, everyday consciousness is reconstituted and the individual's life world reintegrated and renewed. People experience this kind of radical change in their sacred geography any time they have to cope with a significant crisis or loss in their lives. As shown beside life events in the first horizontal row of Diagram 2, the three elements of crisis, grief, and reintegration each represent one of the three distinct phases of an initiation that moves away from the life world where the crisis occurred into a new life world adapted to the new situation. For example, during the middle phase of grief, the grief process, people no longer experience the world in their normal way and they do not go back to experiencing it in the normal way until their time of grieving is over. Some individuals, unfortunately, never seem to finish with their grief and the world never congeals again satisfactorily for them. Instead, they remain in a state of chronic liminality, unable to move on to the third phase and return back to ordinary life. I discussed this phenomenon in the cult experience. Miz also referred to this as in the story of Ariadne's thread, for example. A person who does not understand sacred space or have access to a knowledgeable guide can easily get lost in the labyrinth of transformative space 
It is not good to remain indefinitely in the transitional world of sacred space because profane, mundane space is where we ordinarily must live. Most of our lives are lived out of Eden. Entering sacred space is always an ordeal or trial, whether done voluntarily or involuntarily. One must undergo rituals of degradation and humiliation at the threshold and submit before crossing over into the transitional sacred space. Submission is symbolized culturally in numerous ways. Fraternity hazing, for example, is a vestige of this ancient process and has primordial meaning. Entering the initiation process requires humility. Hinduism has a saying that a temple cannot be found with unbent knee or unbound head. You cannot desecrate the real temple. Rituals of degradation symbolize the spirit of resignation and surrender required to enter sacred space. It is not acceptable otherwise. The ego does not function while in the transitional middle phase. Without linear time, you become disoriented and reality testing is partially suspended and primary process thinking becomes manifest. Grieving, for example, so disorients the perception of time that linear time becomes meaningless. Some have equated this disorienting middle phase with a horrible night sea journey. Tragedy or catastrophe sometimes forces people into these transitions. They get slapped around by life experience so traumatic that humility is their only recourse. It collapses their prized narcissism. This happens a great deal when people are destabilized or decompensated into the quest for initiation and transformation. Of course, submission does not always happen this way. At times, it results from realizing one's own need for regeneration. Here the preliminal phase one is not panicky or acute, as it is in the wake of tragic events. Rather, it comes with a still, small voice to which one listens. Willed submission takes place, and there is controlled regression in service of the ego. Rather than circumstances forcing the course of events, the person makes a decision to enter analysis or spiritual direction. Even here, however, the spirit of submission is a common theme. Leaving the sacred space of transformation reverses the process of entering, and it is often extremely difficult. Some kind of help is usually needed, a foot to boot one out, or a hand from the new profane world to reach in to pull one out. Four primary works by four different scholars share the credit for developing this understanding of a three-phase process of initiation. Arnold Van Genop's book, Rites of Passage, pioneered discussion of the phenomena of phases in ritual passage. To Joseph Campbell's important study, Hero with a Thousand Faces, provided a broad and rich context in world mythology for illustration of these themes. 3. Mercia Iliadi's seminal works, Rites and Symbols of Initiation, and the Sacred and the Profane, defined sacred space and time and showed its significance for understanding religion and initiatory ritual in life and culture. 4. Anthropologist Victor Turner's book, The Ritual Process, made it possible to understand and study all this material in relation to modern industrial culture. The contributions of Van Genap, Campbell, and Turner are all discussed in greater detail in later chapters of the book, but for our purpose here of introducing the concept of sacred space, no one is more important than Mercia Iliadi. We cannot overemphasize the importance of Iliadi's notion of the heterogeneity of space for understanding initiation and both personal and social transformation. This key idea of two separate and distinct kinds of space in human life underlies everything else in his work. The second horizontal row of diagram 2 marked Iliadi illustrates his idea of heterogeneity across the range of the three phases of initiation. We only experience liminal sacred space and time in phase 2 while phases 1 and 3 only occur in profane space and time, indicating that ordinary space normally precedes and follows the experience of sacred space. Profane space differs from sacred space in that it has no fixed point or center from which to gain orientation. Profane space has no access moody, no cosmic tree or pillar leading to the heavens. This is the experience of modernity, people unable to locate a center. Profane space allows no direct contact with the power that enables renewal and regeneration to occur. Inability to locate the center corresponds to an inability to find the source of power necessary for regeneration. Symbolically, this is the inability of finding one's umbilical cord or the mother's breast. Modern persons find this notion difficult to perceive because they have been so exiled from an authentically spiritual or religious understanding of human experience. 
modern secularized individuals typically think that no true center really exists and profane space becomes for them a formidable yet meaningless expanse that is fundamentally unreal. It becomes a creative void and the locus of deterioration. Homo religiosus, however, experiences space quite differently. To quote the classic discussion of Iliades in The Sacred and the Profane, For religious man, space is not homogenous. He experiences interruptions, breaks in it. Some parts of space are qualitatively different from others. Draw not nigh hither, says the Lord to Moses. Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. There is, then, a sacred space, and hence a strong, significant space. There are other spaces that are not sacred, and so are without structure or consistency, amorphous. For religious man, this spatial non-homogeneity finds expression in the experience of an opposition between space that is sacred, the only real and really existing space, and all other space, the formless expanse surrounding it. Thus, the possibility for regeneration of the world occurs through tears in the fabric of ordinary profane space. Iliadi calls such a tear a herophony or manifestation of the sacred. He also uses the term kratophony, manifestation of power, which essentially refers to the same thing. When the sacred erupts, it detaches its nearby territory from the territory surrounding it, and a new point of orientation is revealed. A center is needed to get in touch with regenerative powers. Jungians refer to this fixed point or center as the archetypal self. Ancient individuals found the center through ritual, and they often projected it on physical locations, like Mount Sinai or Golgotha, for example. When no sign manifests itself, one is often provoked by evoking sacred forms and figures, using what is called geomancy, finding the sacred through geography or diagrams of lines and figures. Archaeological excavations show that people often perceived the place as sacred over hundreds and hundreds of years and through the overlapping of many different cultures. Temples are often found in these locations. A sacred place seems to magnetically organize the surrounding culture. For example, a place holy to Muslims, Christians, and Jews was often sacred to the ancient peoples who previously lived in that area. Once sacred space is formed, boundaries form as well. The boundary is a threshold between sacred and profane. Boundaries are traditionally expressed in terms of enclosures, like walls, circles, and stones. The most ancient sanctuaries consisted of circles and stones, as at Stonehenge, for example. These boundaries needed to be stewarded and maintained by ritual leaders, a point given little focused attention by Iliadi. Ancient ritual leaders assumed that harm would certainly occur if the boundary were not properly respected. Numerous rituals existed to facilitate the difficult and dangerous entering and leaving of sacred space, such as taking off one's shoes, various gestures of reproach, mantras, and rituals of ablution, for example. This careful stewarding of the boundaries between sacred and profane space in all traditions testifies to an ancient intuition of its importance to human life. Later, I will elaborate on this phenomenon of boundaries in the modern experience of analysis. Iliadi thinks sacred space was evoked and became manifest through telling the stories of ancestors. In these narratives, the gods appeared, primordial prototypes were imitated, and what Jungians call the archetypes were present. Iliadi does not use the term transition states for regenerative space, but he understands that the experience of sacred space resulted in regeneration. Tribal peoples who understood this, believing that when they created sacred space, they regenerated the whole world. Contemporary research into transitional space supports this view. During a transition phase, there is a deterioration that can be seen as regression to the primitive womb, which explains the power of the symbolism of the mother's body as one prototype for regenerative space. The terms ordinary and extraordinary might work better than profane and sacred. People sometimes misunderstand the meanings of sacred and profane. For tribal culture, because of the contemporary connotations of these words, they jump to the conclusion that Iliadi believed tribal people did not consider all time and space religiously significant. Recently, a Protestant individual accused me of implying that profane time was not religiously significant for Iliadi's homo religiosus. This could not be further from the truth. Profane time for Iliadi is very religiously significant, as was all time and space for the tribal individual. We must distinguish, however, between the religious significance of all time and the regenerative significance of all time. 
Certainly, all time is not equally regenerative. Some time is indeed renewing, but some time is also draining. The Christian theological assumption of the significance of all time does not deny the heterogeneity of time. Tillich's theology of history, for example, does not overrule the common personal experience that sometimes and places have healing effect, while others are draining and even killing. While also history may be interpreted as ultimately regenerative space and time, you can still recognize that it contains many smaller components within its larger cycles of destruction and renewal. Iliadi believed that heterogeneity of space was only true for ancient human beings, that sacred space could only be experienced by individuals in pre-modern tribal cultures. He notices a few traces of sacred space, but nothing really regenerates. He says, Profane space still includes values that to some extent recall the non-homogeneity of religious experience of space. For example, most people consider some privileged places qualitatively different from all others, such as their birthplace or their scenes of first love. Such places still retain an exceptional, a unique quality for even the most frankly non-religious people, as if they held revelations of reality that go beyond those of ordinary everyday life. For another example, war veterans often report experiences of transcending reality on the battlefield that they can relive at veterans' meetings by remembering together the various battles they fought. War and violence often function to evoke such an ecstatic different level of reality for many people. Nonetheless, Iliadi believed that a homogeneous view of space has radically impoverished modern industrial culture. He believed modernity underwent such a fundamental fall that people today are shut off from any real experience of regenerative space. Though Iliadi understood how the homogeneity of space relates to regeneration in human experience, he gave no insight on how to locate sacred space in contemporary culture or how it might function in the modern world. That further development came from Victor Turner when he addressed the problem of fragmented liminality pervading modern culture. Of course, Iliadi found many residual manifestations of the sacred in traditional monotheistic cultures, and I have noted elsewhere that many contemporary pagans, such as practitioners of ritual magic, also seem to have a deep understanding of sacred space. Sacred does not equal God for Iliadi. The consistent factor in pre-modern time was not belief in God, but belief in some kind of regenerative power or libidinal energy that could be tapped into for personal and social regeneration. Unfortunately, few scholars today understand the importance of Iliadi's concept of heterogeneous space. Iliadi himself did not carry the concept over into modern times. He believed that heterogeneity of space was true only for ancient human beings. We must move beyond Iliadi in this regard. His view that space is only homogeneous for modern individuals is erroneous. This is one reason his work is not being used more today to interpret the experiences of contemporary life. Audience member. Perhaps he says that just because it appears so. I can think of some people for whom space and time always appears to be the same. More. Space does indeed appear to remain the same unless you have the proper tools for looking at it. Victor Turner, whose work we will consider in the next chapter, provides the tools for discerning that space is not completely homogeneous in modern experience. Turner thus serves as a bridge between contemporary theorists and Iliadi and Van Genep. It is important to emphasize that for Iliadi, sacred space could only be experienced in pre-modern tribal cultures. He recognized that those cultures had ritual elders, technicians of the sacred, who taught and interpreted the experiencing of sacred space, but he does not adequately emphasize their role in the presence or absence of sacred space. So I agree that it is difficult for modern persons to locate sacred space, and it is also difficult to find knowledgeable elders to steward it. Indeed, based on my research, without the wisdom of the ritual elders, space would have appeared homogeneous even in pre-modern cultures. These elders served as diviners, and they knew how to look for the signs of regenerative space. Iliadi, unfortunately, put too little focus on the important interference between sacred space and ritual leadership, and Turner also failed to see its importance. Both of them implied the relationship, but it needs much more explicit expression than they gave it. I try to do that in my own studies, particularly those on ritual magic in contemporary occult groups. For contemporary culture is not as totally secular as Iliadi, Harvey Cox, and many other writers in the 60s thought it was. 
Their notion of secularity sounds today like the imagination of secularized upper-class professional academicians. Sociological studies constantly show that religious experiences and even paranormal and mystical phenomena are common among many individuals in modern society. Much of the fragmentation in modern culture results from inadequate containment of people's authentically numinous experiences. Religious congregations, for example, could serve as vessels for sacred space, but very few people understand them in this context. Individual congregations lose a critical aspect of their reason for being when they cease to serve as containers for sacred experiencing, but few clergy understand this concept in enough depth to apply it. Some recent flourishings of group work does include this dimension, but the experience of most people today does not. In contemporary church life as actually practiced, sacred space is too terrifying for most people to handle, for inside it is the repressed returns, and opposites are no longer split into neat black and white compartments. Most clergy today do not understand sacred space. The mainstream clergy has domesticated sacred space and time and chosen not to preside over profane space and time and try to inject into it whatever meaning they can. Their attempt to achieve some kind of communitas often comes across as hi y'all, and their efforts to use liturgy often seem naive or merely ceremonial. Turner distinguished ceremony from ritual in that it upholds the status quo and does not, as Jungians would put it, allow the shadow to appear. Current religious practice in mainline Protestant denominations, for example, has almost no sense of sacred initiation. Even baptism as an initiatory rite no longer carries significant numinosity for many people. The same holds true for many other rituals in the contemporary church. There is very little sense of the nature and dynamics of ritual boundaries. The space inside the sanctuary becomes identical to the space outside it, which leaves no need for any special preparation to enter it. The Protestant Reformation waged a great war on medieval ritual practices for arguable reasons, yet at high cost. As a result, Protestants today tend to be ritually tone deaf. Many churches are persona dominated and have replaced the true confessional by rote words. I believe the church is due for revolutionary reappropriation of the ritual wisdom of pre-Reformation Christianity based on a deeper understanding of ritual process now made possible through these new resources. The news that ministers should be ritual leaders would shock many seminarians today, but ministry would be a much more awe-inspiring profession if they took the role of ritual leadership seriously. The claim of ritual eldership, however, seems to have a hierarchical aspect to it that tends to be suspect in contemporary theological circles, clergy fear being accused of elitism and incorrect ideology. Another factor is the Enlightenment view of the universe as a machine. American culture was born during the Enlightenment period. In fact, John Wesley, founder of Methodism, once labeled his movement the Methodist Machine. This metaphor helped lead the church to the formation of corporate ecclesiastical structures as they are known today. These kinds of root metaphors used to describe human life and experiences are very powerful. In Jungian terminology, one equates the metaphor of machine to a functioning of ego, that is, a technical mechanistic stance informed by what Tillich called technical reason. A heroic ego tries to work out every crisis or transition from the ego position with no consideration of the periodic need for the ritual death of the ego. In fact, however, successful transition requires a deconstruction of the ego followed by a reconstitution in a post-transition ego structure. The modern mechanist assumption has no place for ego deconstruction, which would imply a failed machine or a crazy behavior. Instead of allowing deconstruction, people try to forget their strange experiences through psychotropic drugs prescribed presumably to correct their biochemistry. The American mental health establishment has become an extension of the mechanist model. Jungians generally consider this trend an anathema, for they consider ritual death of the ego a necessary part of human experience. Most people today, however, resist considering liminal states as integral to human life, and aside from Jung and those influenced by Jung, very few view them as regenerative. New life cannot begin to germinate until the old has been torn down and cleared away in a process manifesting adequate containment. Victor Turner distinguished between liminal and liminoid space. Both are special forms of space, but in liminal space, the boundaries are stewarded while in liminoid space, they are not. 
The issue of stewarding is complicated, but if an elder cannot maintain the boundaries of sacred space, it may change from liminal to liminoid. This can result in a psychological abortion or a failed initiation. In fact, there are a large number of these. It also happens that people stay in sacred space too long and are unable to leave, a mark of what I call chronic liminality. Sacred space is regenerative space, but experiencing it is not always as good as we often assume. Liberal Christians especially seem prone to romanticize or sanitize experience of the sacred when in reality it is not pleasant most of the time. It can be experienced as horrible. Some call this space the tomb of the womb, the alchemical vessel where you are cooked when you need to be. Hopefully after being appropriately cooked you can return to ordinary space. If not, an abortion may occur. Indeed, many people emerge stillborn from sacred space, like premature babies who cannot survive upon leaving the womb. One can see the close parallel between psychic birth and actual birth. Many of the DSM categories of psychopathology can be interpreted in terms of failed initiation. For example, teenagers branded as having adolescent identity disorders are sometimes in reality only suffering from improper initiatory experiences. Obviously, from my point of view, they are not the ones to blame for this. Something is definitely wrong with contemporary culture when, for example, young black males need to find their puberty rituals in Chicago street gangs that make them commit crimes. These kinds of gang groups understand the importance of ritual without ever having read Victor Turner. They often wield great power in their own domains, but generally offer inadequate initiation processes to their own new members, pseudo-initiations that lead to what I call monster boy behavior. For some years, Louise Madi has looked at these problems while collecting and editing an anthology on contemporary initiation soon to be released by Open Court Publishing. She considers unwed mothers and emotionally disabled war veterans in the context of failed initiatory experiences. She notices how young men, once taught to be efficient killers, now have trouble returning home to ordinary experience. We are better at making warriors, in other words, than we are at bringing them home. This has become a widespread and daunting problem. In summary, Mercia Iliadi is in my view the greatest genius in the field of history of religions and modern scholarship is deeply indebted to him for introducing the concept of sacred space into its discourse. Unfortunately, his work is badly misunderstood and its full importance not yet widely recognized. People who only think of Iliadi as an antiquarian of religion still have not realized the wealth of his material for understanding and renewing culture and for helping human beings value and cherish the various cultural traditions with what Bernard Mellon called an appreciative consciousness audience question. Does any of this come from difference in philosophy such as, for example, those between Plato and Aristotle? Wasn't Plato once considered some kind of mystic? More. Jung stands in the Platonic tradition, obviously. Some people claim that the technical reason so prominent in modern life developed from Aristotelian thought through Aquinas. Personally, however, I tend to believe that the intellectual history of this material is too complex to reduce it to the differences between Plato and Aristotle. The trends can be overdone. As for Plato, his mystical esotericism has been concealed by philosophy departments in modern universities, but we should remember that during his time an awareness of the esoteric, what we might call the experience of Gnosis, was very much alive. Audience question. Can you give us an overview of what psychoanalysts in general think about the concept of sacred space and its relevance to their work? More. Many psychoanalysts, including Freud, have simply misunderstood the specialness of space in psychotherapy. By contrast, Jung long ago connected analysis to alchemy and paralleled the analytic relationship to the sealed vessel or alchemical container in which transformation occurs. For many years, people believed Jung's writings on transference phenomena were mystical and obscure, but that is beginning to change. Now even some Freudians are beginning to realize that transference does not merely repeat an old object relationship in a new situation, but carries the potential for the transformation sought by the client. Freudian analyst Robert Langs goes so far as to consider transference the sin qua non key to transformation. This is where sacred space exists. It is only one such place in contemporary culture, of course. There are many others. Chapter 3 on the Vessel of Analysis discusses these issues in more detail. Audience question. Could you elaborate on what liminoid space is? More. 
Liminoid space consists of extraordinary space where careful attention is not paid to the boundaries. Vacation time is one example. Las Vegas is preeminently liminoid space for middle and lower class middle America. Lake Tahoe, Rust Street, Bourbon Street, and Mount Shasta are others. Religious pilgrimages are predominantly liminoid experiences. Self-destruction can result from looking for liminality in liminoid forms. Sometimes, for example, a person gets too close to the fire when searching for liminal experiences, as in drug or alcohol-induced ecstatic experiences. The true locus of personal transformation is in a contained and secure liminality, but it tends to be fragmented in the modern world that we experience liminoid space more often than liminal. The human organism may sense a psychobiological need for liminality and look for it in a boundary like the mountains, the seashore, or the forest, or in a variety of socially marginal experiences. Sadly, these experiences are usually not truly transformative. The next chapter gives a more thorough discussion of the contrast between liminoid and liminal space.